Hello everyone, Toaster here, your third most favorite kitchen appliance, and welcome to a very special bonus video of the Ultimate Beginner's Train Guide for Satisfactory, better known as the game of... Uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Oh my god, where is it? In this video, we will be going over tips on how to lay down your rail segments to help you make a nice and neat looking rail network. Rails are no doubt finicky to build with, and they will terrorize you with some of the greatest hits of warning errors, including the railroad track is too short. The railroad track has a too sharp turn. And of course, the multiple award-winning hit, invalid aim location. And of course, this leaves you struggling trying to figure out how to work around this frustrating build system. So here are some tips that you can use to conquer this finicky build system for Rails and Satisfactory. I was going to put this in with the final video in the series, part three, but that starts getting very technical, so it really didn't fit the theme of the video. And I would have included this with part one or part two, but it just didn't fit. This is a highly requested video and one that is worthy of its own dedicated upload anyway, so here it is. Special bonus video. I know I said part three was going to be the final video in the series, but yeah. I change that now, because the things I do are just that well thought out. As always, you can skip to your desired section by clicking on the bookmarks in the description below. So, let's get this guide started with a new segment I like to call, Building with Toaster. Just get on with it! First off, you can place rails along the terrain, but it's very difficult to give sound advice for this as they can be quite unpredictable, leaving you with rail segments that start or end at awkward angles, or ones that are clipping through objects and the terrain as well. If you plan on building along the terrain, then I do apologize, but you are more or less going to be on your own here. It is going to be much easier to lay down your rails cleanly by building them on foundations. We can use foundations as a grid, which will make it substantially easier to measure your rail segments. And you could always delete the foundations later when you're done with them. Now you may say, Toaster, I don't want my rails to defy the laws of physics by being suspended in midair, and I don't want floating foundations either, because then I'll have to go out of my way to build supports for them. And to that good sir, I say, that is totally understandable. But there's a quick and easy fix for this. We can use pillars to act as supports. First, you'll need to unlock them in the awesome shop. You can find them under the architecture tab in the shop menu. There are three pillar packages available, each one in one of three different materials. They cost two coupons each. You only need one of these packages, but you can get all three of them if you like. After purchasing one, you can then open up the build menu, go over to the architecture tab, and then select your pillar of choice. The pillars, both thin ones and big bone ones, and in all available materials, will directly snap attach to the bottom of your rail segments. The pillar supports in particular will snap attach to the bottom of your rail segments. However, four out of five doggos would agree that they do so in the wrong direction. And as of now, you cannot scroll the mouse wheel to change this direction. However, we can manipulate this mechanic to get our desired fit. For small pillars, we can accomplish this by first placing down a middle pillar under our rail segment. Then by building another middle pillar either above or below it. Your choice. Then go ahead and delete that first pillar. Then finally, if you built below, you can stack two pillar supports above it to make it fit in the proper direction. Or if you built above it, then aim in just the right direction to lock onto that middle pillar that we have clipping into the rail. You can then place a pillar support underneath it, which you can then rotate with the scroll wheel to get the proper fit. Delete any unnecessary items that you don't need, and there you go. Same goes with the fat pillars, however, if you are building underneath the rails, then you do not have to stack two pillar supports on top of each other. They are so husky that you only need to place down the one pillar support to get the proper fit. By doing this, you can quickly and cheaply make your rails look a little more practical and stop them from defying the laws of physics at the same time. And you can do this without having to make large complex fancy support like these. Also, let's mention beams for a quick second. They will not snap attach neatly to the bottom of the rail segments like pillars do, but they can still be placed underneath the rail segments. As you can see, just not nearly as clean as pillars will. Moving forward, all construction will be explained by using foundations as a grid for measurement purposes. 
I like to center my rail segments in the center of the grid. This makes it easier to lay out and measure our rail segments. Also, when we lay down train stations and platforms, we should do the same just for sake of consistency. All stations, freight, and decorative platforms are two foundations long, but are just over four foundations wide. However, when you place these down, place them on a 2x5 grid, and center the station right in the middle of that center foundation. Again, this just makes it easier to lay out our rail segments. Now you may say, Toaster, I already have an expansive rail network, and I already placed down all my stations, but they are not centered on the foundation like that, and I don't feel like deleting and rebuilding them because that's a lot of work, and then I'll have to reprogram all my timetables. Well, no worries there, here are two quick tips for you. We can whip out those pillars again to help manipulate the build mechanics of the game to allow us to center our foundations for all building purposes. However, in this scenario, we will discuss how we can apply this to train stations. Simply place down a small pillar of your choice on the side of the foundation, and center it on the rail of the train station. You can then whip out a foundation of your choice and you could snap it right into place by clipping it into that small pillar. And just like that, you now have a foundation that is centered on your awkwardly placed train station. We can use catwalks and walkways in a similar manner, which can help you in some cases, but not all of them. Pillars are far superior to the catwalks and allow for finer adjustments, but you still can utilize the catwalks in a similar manner. Simply place down the foundation you want to manipulate first. Then, if you want to move the foundation left or right, place the catwalk behind it. If you want to move the foundation up or down, then place the catwalk next to it. As you can see, doing this allows us to make very fine adjustments to the location of the foundation. Pillars will work in almost all scenarios, so they are superior in that sense, but catwalks can also work in a pinch if needed. Now there are two flavors of catwalks, one is called the catwalk, and the other one is titled the walkway. And they can be purchased from the awesome shop under the architecture tab for 5 coupons each. Now a quick recap on the lengths of our rail segments. The shortest rail segment we can make is 1.5 foundations long, but this can be finicky and varies depending on which direction that your foundations are facing. Sometimes the game can end up forcing you to make rail segments slightly over 1.5 foundations long, meaning that attempting to use the 1.5 foundation long segment as a base measurement in your world for your rail network can be very inconsistent to use. My personal recommendation is to make your shortest rail segments two foundations long, and for three reasons. The first, for the reason that I just explained, because one and a half segments is finicky and inconsistent. The second, because our train stations and our platforms are also two foundations long. When constructing rail segments going up to and next to the station or platforms, we can maintain the same length so we can stay consistent with the rest of our rails in our network. And finally, because two foundations long is the perfect size to fit a single locomotive or freight car, making it very easy to predict and manage the measurements of our rail segments in terms of our trains. The longest rail segment you can make is 12 and a half foundations long. And again, can be just under 12 and a half foundations long, depending on the direction that you lay down your rails. But for consistency's sake, I recommend building 12 foundations long, again, just to maintain easy and consistent measurements. Okay, from here on out, you'll hear me talk about starter segments and end segments. These segments are there just to use as a guide and can be deleted afterwards and replaced with your actual rails. They are more or less a visual building guide and they represent your actual completed rails that you'll be building on your network. Let's first talk about a trick that we can use to manipulate rails to get them to do what we want. You may have noticed that if you build a rail by dragging it off of a starter segment, then the finished result can be a bit awkward. In terms of inclines, it can leave the resulting rail segment pointing in angles that are impossible to accommodate. And in terms of turning segments, the resulting rail segment can leave you with ridiculously sharp and over-exaggerated angles, both of which can be extremely difficult to build off of. In order to manipulate the rails to get them to do what we want, we can simply accomplish this by placing down an end segment first. Place down an end segment in the desired location that you want to build your rail to. This segment will act as our build guide, and it could be any length that you want. Then, simply drag out your rail from the starter segment and bring it to the end segment. As you'll notice, the resulting rail has a vastly superior fit and finish than if we tried to do this without building our rail to an end segment. I recommend doing this for any and all inclined and turning rail segments that you want to place down in your world. It is a simple and easy little trick that will make your rails look super clean. Now, we can use foundations as a grid to create clean, straight segments of rail. 
But what if we want to create a more organic looking rail network? Well, that involves a little trial and error, but here's a good way to accomplish this. Go to your starter segment and from it, drag out a temporary rail across the terrain to the general area where you want your organic rail segment to end. Find a distance that works for you, but don't go too far. When you found the place that you want to build the rail to, then if desired, you can lay down that segment of rail to use as a guide. This also helps if you are building over very long distances and you are using a hover pack. Since rails give off electricity by proximity, this will help keep your hover pack powered, allowing you to maintain a bird's eye view to make construction easier. Or instead, you could just keep your crosshairs at that location and switch to a foundation. That's up to you. Either way, swap to a foundation and lay it down in that spot. Then you could go ahead and build it up to your desired height. We do not need to match the height to the exact specifications of the previous rail segment. Just go ahead and eyeball it. Attach a few more foundations behind it so you have room to lay down an end segment. Then go ahead and place down an end segment to your desired length. When I build organic rail segments, I like to make my rails centered on the foundation like so. And if you are using foundations to act as supports for your rails, then this keeps it looking clean as well. After that, go ahead and place down your organic rail segment by attaching it from the previous starter segment and down to the end segment. And lastly, you could go ahead and delete the end segment. You won't need it anymore. Now you have a nice organic looking rail segment spanning across your map. Now, if you are building a double rail network or an even larger rail network than that, then accomplishing this is just the same, except we're going to extend out the destination foundation by a few off to the side. Keep in mind that when you are initially placing down the temporary rail segment, that if you push the limit of the distance of that rail, then depending on which way you extend out the foundations, your inner rails may reach just fine, but the outer rails may just barely be out of the reach of the organic rail segment that you want to place down. Now say that you did in fact overextend the length of the rail, but you are not in the mood to delete or redo it. Well, you can just place down a few foundations going opposite of the end segment in order to accommodate a small extension segment of your desired length to get your rail to reach. It looks a bit awkward, but it gets the job done and you should go ahead and match this to the inner rail as well, just to keep them looking uniform. If we want to be able to traverse the rough terrain on the strange world that has an even stranger name, then we need to master building inclined rails. Trying to manage height can be a bit funky. Managing straight rail segments and managing corners are very cut and dry, but inclines tend to vary a lot, and on screen you can see an example of the shortest possible distances of rail segments in regards to the different available heights that we could accommodate. As you can see, it is very inconsistent, but in order to keep things simple, neat, and comparable to the rest of our rail network, a good rule of thumb is 4 meters high, or better explained as a single 4 meter foundation high, for every two foundations long. Now, when linking multiple inclines to gain height over long distances, we can use flat foundations just fine. But as you can see, this method results in a very wavy incline. We can remedy this by placing our rails on ramp foundations, and the resulting incline is a nice and smooth transition between rail segments. In order to do this, we can still follow the rule of thumb of 4 meters high for every two foundations long, but the available 4 meter ramp will not work. You will get one of the greatest hits of warning errors, the railroad track is too steep. So we must use a 2 meter ramp which we will stack on top of a 2 meter foundation. The result we get is a clean connection that can be chained together to make seamless, smooth inclines. Also, while we're on the subject of inclines, it is important to note that train collisions are also based on height. So if you're building overpasses or underpasses on your rail network, then make sure to build those rails high enough or low enough to clear other trains. The threshold for this appears to be 5 meters of foundations high for a train to either safely pass over or under one another without causing a collision. Although, going with the minimum threshold, you will notice that slight clipping will occur. However, 8 meters of foundations high is a nice height that offers plenty of clearance and is a personal choice of mine as well. Now, let's talk about making crisp, clean turns. The smallest 90 degree turn that we can make will be on a 3x3 grid of foundations placed down in an L shape like so. First, place down your starter segment just outside of the 3x3 grid that is leading up to the very edge of it. Then, place down your turn segment by dragging out a rail from the starter segment and bringing it to the center of the very outer edge of that last foundation on our L-shaped grid. Then, you can lay down your end segment and continue on building your network. It is important to note that you cannot place down a turn segment between a starter rail and an end rail. For reasons unbeknownst to me, the game will refuse to do this. 
it will not work. The game darn well knows that it is perfectly possible, but you have slighted it in some way that is completely unbeknownst to you. So now it lays its aggressions on you passively while you're left trying to figure out what you did wrong. Just like my girlfriend. I am sorry, Karen. Will you please just tell me what is wrong? So you most place the starter segment down first and then the turn segment and finally the end segment. And by doing it this way, it will work no problem. You can incorporate inclines into these turns quite easily by stacking eight meters worth of foundations on top of each other. The limit for this is actually 9 meters, but for ease and consistency, I like to go with 8 meters worth of foundations. And this also makes it easier when trying to lay down 45 degree turns on an incline, which you'll see why in just a moment. So we can stack two 4 meter foundations above the end foundation to increase our height, like so. Just drag out your turn segment to the very edge of that foundation, just like before, and this will result in a steady incline turn. Or to decrease our height, we can replace the original end foundation with a 4 meter foundation then stack two more 4 meter foundations underneath it. Keep the 4 meter foundation to use as your new base, and go ahead and delete the two higher 4 meter foundations to clear out your workspace. Then lay down your turn segment by dragging it to the very edge of that bottom foundation just like before. By doing this, we can incorporate inclines into our turns to tackle height differences in our networks for nice gradual height changes. If tackling scenarios where you need to combine multiple incline 90 degree turns together to create a nice, smooth, and seamless incline, then we could use that trick with the 2 meter tall ramp foundation stacked on a regular 2 meter foundation to keep the transition between our inclines wave free. Going up is easy, just lay down a 4 meter foundation first, followed by a 2 meter foundation, and then a 2 meter ramp foundation, ensuring that it is facing the proper direction in relation to your incline. To go down, again replace the original end foundation with a 4 meter foundation, then place another 4 meter foundation underneath that one, then stack two 2 meter foundations underneath that, delete the upper 2 meter foundation, and finally lay down a 2 meter ramp foundation, again ensuring that it is facing the proper direction to match your desired incline. In order to create larger 90 degree turns, you just follow the same process as before, but just build your L-shaped grid to your desired size. The overall limit for this before you start getting greatest hits errors is on an 8x8 grid. Also, larger size 90 degree turns will not glitch out when attempting to squeeze them between a starter segment and an end segment. That will only apply to the smallest possible 90 degree turn on the 3x3 grid. Incorporating inclines into the larger 90 degree turns will vary by height, and as well it is inconsistent. But again, just for ease and consistency, a good rule of thumb is that for every one foundation increase in the size of your turn, you can increase your height by a max of 4 meters, if desired. Let's talk about the 45 degree turn. It's half of the 90 degree turn. This is useful to create nice small angles where a full 90 degree turn is not needed, and great for making small turns that you can incorporate into simple intersections. In order to make a 45 degree turn, we will start by placing down a 2x2 two two grid of foundations in an L shape. Lay down a starter segment that is leading up to the edge of the 2x2 two two foundation. Now from your starter segment, drag out a section of rail and aim the corners of the rail segments in between the outer corner of the last foundation and right on the dead center of that foundation. We can also use power poles as guides. Just place down a power pole right in the center of the foundation, and if desired, you can place one down on the outer corner as well. Then simply line up the corners of the rail segment with those power poles. Also, what's great about the 45 degree turn is that it can bypass the glitch that we face with the 90 degree turn. Whereas the 90 degree turn glitches out when placing a corner segment between a starter segment and an end segment, the 45 degree turn does not do that. It will snap together perfectly. So if you have an area where you already laid out a clean series of rails and you just need that one final 90 degree turn to finish it off, but you encounter that weird glitch where you darn well know that it is perfectly possible to lay down that 90 degree turn, and on top of that you either can't or don't want to start deleting and redoing the entire series of rails you just laid down, then you can simply place down two 45 degree rails in between and they will snap together just fine. In all other scenarios, if you're combining two 45 degree turns together to make a 90 degree turn, then make sure to build them in between a starter segment and an end segment. If you do not, then you will notice that the 45 degree turn will not line up properly, and any other rail that you want to attach it to can end up looking just a bit awkward. You may think that the 45 is superior to the 90 degree, but not in all scenarios, as incorporating smooth inclines into these rails can be quite difficult. 
Now, incorporating regular wavy inclines into these turns is quite simple. To either go up or down, you are going to want to go with a single 4 meter foundation. The 4 meter foundation is the game's build limit for this type of incline turn, but also by going with a 4 meter foundation, it will keep the height of your turn segment consistent with that of the 90 degree turn, meaning that if you need to use the 245 degree turn trick to circumnavigate the game's passive aggressiveness of the 90 degree turn, then you will be able to snap those rails together on an incline with no problems. If you're combining 245 degree incline turns to make an inclined 90 degree turn, then be sure to build them in between a starter segment and an end segment. Neglecting to do so can leave your finished rail segment facing in an ever so slightly awkward angle. Creating inclines with a 45 degree turn follows the same method as the 90 degree incline. To go up, just place down a 4 meter foundation over the end foundation on your grid. To go down, replace the end foundation with a 4 meter foundation, then place another 4 meter foundation underneath that one. And finally, delete the upper 4 meter foundation to clear your workspace. But now here is where the 45 degree turn loses its sense of superiority. Incorporating a ramp to create a smooth incline for the 45 degree turn requires a ton of manipulation that in the end doesn't come out perfect anyway. I don't consider it to be worth it, so for now, unfortunately, I'm going to say just use flat foundations to create wavy inclines with 45 degree turns. It still functions perfectly fine, it's just going to look wavy. If a 90 degree turn on a 3x3 grid is the smallest right angle turn that we can make, then when we combine two of them together, we get a U-turn. The game won't let you make U-turns right off the bat, so by combining two 90 degree turns together, we can make one anyway. This is the smallest U-turn that you can make, which you can then incorporate into your rail network however you see fit. As an example, you can use it on single rail networks so you can have a train make a U-turn that is directly coming out of a train station. Or you can use it to act as a general U-turn in your double rail network. If you decide to lay it flat, then this will create a complex intersection, and I would recommend adjusting the length of your rail segments accordingly in order to accommodate the placement of block and possibly path signals. Or you can incorporate inclines into it in order to raise it up above your network or lower it down below it. You will still end up creating simple intersections at the entrances and exits of the U-turn, and at the minimum you should incorporate at least block signals into it, but by building a U-turn with the incline method, it will help mitigate traffic and you could avoid having to use path signals as well. As we begin our discussion of simple and complex intersections, let's also talk about branching out rail segments from each other. You can branch out up to three segments of rail from a single segment of rail. Only three. And we can only have one segment of rail go into many segments of rail. But we cannot have many segments of rail going into many segments of rail. The game will not allow this. Also, if we delete the initial segment of rail, then reattach it to the many segments, then trains will still be able to travel on it in any direction just fine. For those satisfactory vets who dabbled with trains before Update 5, you'll know that this was not always possible. However, now after Update 5, I can confidently state that this mechanic is now functioning as intended. Now let's talk about simple intersections. A simple intersection is any intersection that can only have one train occupying it at any given time without crashing. They generally don't require too much thought to set up, so we're not going to be going over all of them, but just a few examples of some common ones. One tip for you is that if you want to split your rails into two or more parallel lines that is one foundation away from the original rail line, then place down an end segment that is three foundations away from the start of the original rail segment. You can then snap that branching rail segment right into place. I like to match the original rail segment to length so that you can keep your signals all nice and tidy. If you have a parallel line that is two foundations away from your original rail line, you'll have to place the end segment five foundations away from the start of the original rail segment. For parallel lines that are three or four foundations away from the original rail line, you'll have to place that end segment six foundations away from the starter segment. And from there on, you can experiment as needed for greater lengths. This is just to give you an idea on how to build these intersections cleanly. Again, simple intersections don't require too much thought to set up, and as an example, here's a simple Y intersection and a crisscross intersection. My recommendation to keep them clean is to, of course, use foundations as a guide in order to lay your rails down neatly. In order to make them compatible and look clean with signals, I like to place down brakes in my rail segments close to my intersections, but not too close. When constructing this crisscross intersection, I like to keep one grid space in between the brakes of my segments to keep our block as small as possible and to make signal placement look neat and tidy. As for the simple Y intersection that has a full 90 degree turn branching off of it, 
The end of the 90 degree turn is going to mark down where we will place one of our signals. But as for the straight rail segment, I like to place down the break of it right at the edge of the foundation that is in line with where that turn segment ends. Again, just to keep the block as small as possible and to keep our signal placement tidy. This is just a personal preference of mine. You can of course build these intersections however you like. Up next, let's talk about creating some complex intersections. A complex intersection is any intersection that can have two or more trains occupying it without crashing. Again, we won't be going over every single complex intersection as there are far too many possibilities to cover, but we're just going to go over a few examples of some key ones that you can build off of and adapt to your own network. These intersections are the ones that I use in my world, and I will be constructing them as such. These intersections are going to be for a double rail system. Unfortunately, I will not be addressing intersection construction for rail systems larger than this, but if you do have larger systems with more rails, then hopefully this will give you a good foundation to be able to build off of to accommodate your larger network. Now, my rails are three foundations wide, and of course they are centered on those outer foundations. You can build these intersections however you like. You can build them at the minimum of two foundations wide, or four foundations wide, or even more. You cannot build these larger than six foundations wide, because then the length of a rail starts getting too long. Well, actually, again, you just have to start getting really creative with how you lay down your rail segments, because in these scenarios, you start pushing the limits of the length of the rails. But anyway, it's up to you on how wide you want to build these intersections. But for ease of explanation and consistency, I will be building them three foundations wide. These intersections work with both left and right hand drive, so there's no concerns for those who drive on the wrong side of the road. No, no, we already did that bit. We are moving on. It is going to be difficult to explain how to construct these complex intersections, so it is best off to just show you step by step. First, let's start with a T intersection. Go ahead and lay down a platform of foundations in an 11 by 3 grid. And then from the center of that grid, build a 3 by 4 extension grid in your desired direction. Now you're going to place down four starter rail segments first. Place down two segments, each at both ends of your grid, each spanning two foundations long and leaving a one foundation space in between them, like so. Then go ahead and lay down your two 90 degree turns by dragging them out from the inner starter rails and over to the extension grid leaving a two foundation gap to the end of the extension grid. Then drag out two foundation long end rail segments from those 90 degree turns, bringing them right up to the edge of the extension grid. Now implement the longer turn segments by dragging them from the outer starter rail segments and drag each of them out to the opposing end rail segments that you just laid down. Then finally do the straightaways by simply connecting the starter segments from one side and directly across to the other starter segments on the opposite side. And that's all there is to it. Again, the starter and end segments are just here for ease of construction and they represent your rail network. You can delete these afterwards and they will connect to any other rails that you replace it with, all without breaking the functionality of your intersection. Again, this works for two foundation and four foundation Y rail networks. The method of constructing them is exactly the same. However, for two foundation wide networks, you're just going to start off with a 10 by 2 grid and you're going to utilize a 2 by 4 extension grid. And on a four foundation wide network, you'll start off on a 12 by 4 grid and utilize a 4 by 4 extension grid. Also, when it comes to implementing signals into these complex intersections, let's not forget our golden rule of signal placement. Path signals at all the entrances to our complex intersections and block signals at all the exits. Now, let's talk about the four-way intersection. Well, it's exactly like the T intersection that we just laid out, but we're going to add another extension grid on the opposite side of it to accommodate a fourth entrance and exit to it. For the three foundation wide network, you're going to build this on an 11 by three grid. Build it as if you were constructing the T intersection, but with another three by four extension grid on the opposite side. Go ahead and construct it exactly as you would the T intersection. And then from there, we're just going to drag out two more 90 degree turns to the new extension grid, leaving that two foundation space at the end of it to accommodate the end rail segments. Then go ahead and drag out those two end rails from those 90 degree turns. Then incorporate the long turns by connecting the outer starting rails to the new end segments. And finally finish it off by dragging out the straights from the end segments on one side and to the end segments on the opposite side, which will complete our beautiful four-way intersection. See? Lovely. Incorporating two foundation-wide and four foundation-wide networks is exactly the same, except for two foundation-wide networks, just add a two by four extension grid, or for four foundation-wide networks, a four by four extension grid. And once again, for signal incorporation, utilize the golden rule, place path signals at all the entrances to our complex intersection, and block signals at all the exits. Finally, the roundabout. The roundabout is great as it functions almost as good as a three or four way intersection, but it also functions as a U-turn as well. The downside to it is that it is going to be significantly larger than those other intersections, 
and building it is going to be a little more involved. Now doing this requires a bunch of steps, so be sure to follow along. In order to make a very small but functional roundabout, we are going to build a 9x9 grid of foundations. Eventually, we will be adding extension grids to this on all sides, so be sure to plan accordingly. After you built your 9x9 grid, choose where you want to start making your first turn. On the outermost foundation of the grid, we are going to place a starter segment and an end segment of rail. On the very center of the two foundations of where we want to squeeze our first turn between. If you count it out, this is going to be the fifth foundation from the corners on the outermost edges of your grid. Place down your starter and end segments of rail on the very center of those foundations, but going in the opposite direction of where you want to squeeze your first turn between. Next up, in the direction that you intend to start making that turn, you're going to go over two foundations and then up one foundation. And in the direct center of that foundation, you're going to place down a power pole, which we will be using as a visual guide. Do the same for the other side as well. Then from your starter segment, you're just going to drag out a rail and line up the inner corner of that rail segment to that power pole, like so. Don't clip it into the pole, just place it down right before the pole. This will leave an ever so slight gap in between the corner of that rail segment and the pole. Go ahead and do this for the other side as well. Then you are simply going to combine those two tiny turn segments with another final rail segment, which will fill in the gap that was left over, and thus creating our first completed turn. If you did it right, then it will snap together no problem and it will look very clean and very rounded. You can go ahead and get rid of the initial starter and end segment. We don't need them anymore. Now rinse and repeat for the three other turns of the roundabout, adding and deleting additional end segments when needed. until you have a nice, complete, round looking circle. But we're not done yet. We still need to add our entrances and exits. So this is where we will need to lay down our extension grid. Go ahead and build out three x three extension grids from the center of the larger nine x nine grid. Do this for as many sides as you need. In this example, we will be doing it on all four sides. On each of those extensions that you place down, go ahead and create two end segments, dragging them out from the very edges of those extensions and leaving a one foundation gap between them and also leaving a one foundation gap between those end segments and the roundabout that you just created. Then from there, you simply go to that inner segment from the turn of the roundabout and from it, drag out a rail to the end segments on the extension grid. Rinse and repeat for all sides and then your roundabout will be complete. Again, you could go ahead and delete those end segments as desired and replace them with your actual rails. Also, I will note that you can accomplish this final step without having to use end segments, you could just go ahead and drag out a rail from the inner turn segment of the roundabout to the edge of the foundation, but it will not line up perfectly, which can make any rails that you connect it to look a bit awkward. Again, this example is for a three foundation wide rail network. In order to get this to work with a two foundation wide rail network, our extension grid will have to be three by four foundations large, making it one foundation longer than the three foundation wide rail network. We can either build on the seams of the foundation like so, or to keep things tidy, we can use catwalks or pillars to manipulate the location of the foundations so that we can center our rails on them. Simply place down your end segments, this time two foundations away from your roundabout, and again connect the inner turn segment on the roundabout to the end segments on the extension grid to complete your fancy round circle. For a four foundation wide rail network or wider, this will not immediately work because trying to connect those inner turn segments from the roundabout to the end segments will result in you getting one of the greatest hits of rail errors. The rail has a too sharp turn, so you have to get creative and for a brief moment, we'll have to narrow down your rail network to either three or two foundations wide leading up to the roundabout. But congratulations on your fancy circle. This is a very small but functional roundabout that you can construct and is an example that you could use or to give you an idea on how to lay out larger roundabouts. When constructing larger roundabouts, it is important to have a single turn section of the roundabout comprised of at least three separate rail segments, just like the example that we just created. Doing this will allow you to cleanly accommodate entrance and exits to the roundabout. Again, in order to incorporate signals into this roundabout, we will follow the golden rule of signal placement, pass signals at all the entrances and block signals at all the exits. 
You can place down pass signals along the turning segments as well if you'd like. However, it won't make any real noticeable difference in the functionality of the roundabout. I placed them down thinking that it does, and since then, I have yet to delete them. Okay, listen, it's on my list. Now, in regards to roundabouts, you may say, well, toaster. The smallest 90 degree turn that we can make is on a 3x3 grid. So we can combine four of those together to make a very small roundabout. Damn it, you're wrong! Great idea, but that will not work as the 3x3 90 degree turn acts out in a fit of passive aggressiveness similar to that of a certain significant other and cannot be squeezed in between a starter segment and an end segment. So when we get to that final turn segment, we will not be able to finish it. We can bypass that by filling in the gap with two 45 degree turns instead, but then we run into another problem. Since we cannot connect many segments of rail into many segments of rail, we cannot incorporate any practical functionality into this roundabout. Now you may say, well, Toaster, what if we get rid of the 90 degree turn altogether and comprise this roundabout with a bunch of 45 degree turns instead? And to that I say, yes, that is possible. However, it will simply act as a fancy U-turn, which can accommodate trains in two directions of travel. With this roundabout, we can add entrances and exits to it, but as mentioned before, since we cannot attach many segments of rail into many segments of rail, we are limited to just two entrances and two exits. But this is still a great looking and small little intersection that can allow trains to make U-turns on your network. In order to build this intersection, start off on a 6x6 grid of foundations. Simply create a complete circle of 45 degree turns. Refer to the 45 degree turn part of the video if you need a reference on how to create them, but for a quick refresher, you're going to go over two foundations and up one foundation from a starter segment. Then from the starter segment, you're going to drag out a rail to the last foundation and line up the rail segment to the center of the foundation and the outer corner of it. When creating these 45 degree turns, do them two at a time and remember to place them down in between a starter segment and an end segment. Failure to do so will make it impossible to finish this circle cleanly. Rinse and repeat for all sides. After completing the circle, add a 3x4 extension grid on opposite sides of each other. For a three foundation wide rail network, place down two end segments of rails along the seams of the foundations like so, leaving a one foundation gap between the end segments and the roundabout. As mentioned before, if desired, you can utilize the trick with the pillars to center the foundations to make laying down your rail segments just a tad easier. Then go ahead and connect the end segments to their respective turn segments on the roundabout to finish the construction of your classy U-turn. Just like the larger roundabout, to accommodate two foundation-wide networks, build a 2x4 extension segment and leave a two-foundation gap between the end segments and the roundabout. And to accommodate four foundation-wide rail networks or larger, you're going to have to narrow down your rails leading up to the roundabout to either two or three foundations wide. Also, signal placement is the same as always, pass signals at the entrances and block signals at the exits. And finally, you can create this hard, overly complex abomination that has four 90 degree turns that have two foundation long segments in between them and that have crossover sections at the entrances and exits to maintain the right hand drive principle. But that's your choice. I'm not even going to explain this one. I cannot condone this type of construction in Satisfactory. And this also isn't even round, it's a rounded square. It's different. But that covers a few examples of complex intersection construction, including the fabled roundabout. Build these enough times and eventually you'll be able to build them blindfolded. Actually, I would not recommend that. And for one final trick, we can clip foundations into rails. I like to use one meter foundations for this. Just whip out the foundation and adjust it ever so slightly by dragging it away from the center of the rail until it just barely clips through the bottom of it. Now you may say, Toaster, why the heck are you doing this? Well, by doing this, we can gingerly place a wall outlet on the bottom of the foundation. We can then try to center the power outlet as well as we possibly can and we can then delete the foundation, and this will result in us having a means to transport electricity along our rails cleanly and subtly. Now, you may say that rails carry electricity through them, but by proximity only, which means that that only benefits us when using a hover pack. We cannot directly attach cables or power connectors to our rails, meaning that we can only access our power grid through the use of train stations. But by sneaking power outlets underneath the rails, we can transport electricity to a factory that runs along our rail network, 
but that does not have a train station at it. And as an example, witness these few lone yet beautiful water extractors humbly basking in a calm yet babbling river. A sight to behold for sure. We can also utilize this in a way to transport electricity to lights that you have placed down to illuminate your network. Also, this method is useful for getting power cables to subtly go around corners or up and down inclines. By clipping foundations into rails, you can frequently place down power outlets in key locations to help avoid exposing cables around turns and to help avoid cables from clipping through rails when going up inclines. And with that, that marks the end of building with toaster. <laughs> and the end of this free special bonus video of the Ultimate Beginner's Train Guide for Satisfactory. In this video, we covered many things. There are a lot of different configurations and a lot of different possible intersections that you can construct, and this guide just barely scratched the surface on that. But hopefully you now have the knowledge to be able to tackle any configuration that you put your mind to. Now this is the free surprise super special bonus video in this three-part guide, but be sure to also check out part one, where we covered a technical breakdown of the complete basics and part two where we broke down our signals and network types. And also be on the lookout for part three, which will be the final video in the series, maybe, where we'll be going over how to implement railroad networks into your factory, how to calculate resource throughput, and we will cover methods to solve a wide range of problems with network troubleshooting. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then be sure to like and subscribe. As always, I've been Toaster. Peace out. Karen, will you please just talk to me?